Welcome to Six Degrees of Wiki, a podcast where two sisters find the six degrees of separation between Wikipedia articles that don't seem to have anything in common. I'm Nikki. And I'm Rosanna. Today we'll fall into a Wikipedia spiral where Nikki has just six rounds to figure out how the first article could possibly be connected to the last, while learning all sorts of peculiar facts along the way. Let's get started. So far this month, we've spiraled from Kate Blanchett to Louis XIV of France. Round one. Today, we are spiraling from Louis XIV to Doppelganger. <gasps> Louis XIV was the king of France from 1643 until 1715. A doppelganger is a non-biologically related lookalike of a person, sometimes portrayed as ghostly or paranormal, and is usually seen as a harbinger of bad luck. Nikki, do you see anything that these two degrees have in common? I'm going to have to go back to what I said last episode. They're both people, and neither are English. (laughs) (laughs) All I can think of is the doppelganger from... The Vampire Diaries, and so I'm kind of stuck on that one. Yeah. So an original vampire and Louis the Fourteenth and vampires surely came from Europe, right? I have no idea. Sh- surely they came from Europe. There's something in there, right? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> All right. So we learned about Louis the Fourteenth in the last episode. Now we're going to learn some more information about him. King Louis was born in... September of 1638. He was also known as Louis the Great or the Sun King. He was a monarch of the House of Bourbon and reigned as King of France from when he was four years old in 1643 until his death in 1715. His parents were Louis the Thirteenth and Anne of Austria. They had been married for 23 years when he was born. Wow. His mother had had four miscarriages before they had him, so they viewed his birth as an absolute miracle from God. I bet. But he had a little brother, too, so... Yeah, so they had Philippe, his brother, two years later, and then when Louis was four, his father died, which is why he became king at four. So Louis had a very affectionate relationship with his mother, and it was from her he got the belief of absolute and divine power for a monarch, which... He retained for his whole life. He exercised fully. Yeah. (laughs) He and his wife, Marie Therese, had six children, but only the oldest one survived to adulthood. He, of course, was also named Louis. Louis XIV had more than a dozen children with multiple mistresses. (sighs) One of his mistresses, he had seven children with. Goodness. Marie Therese died in 1683, and Louis married his children's governess later that year. The marriage wasn't ever officially announced, but it was an open secret. And he was actually faithful to her. Louis commissioned a ton of art portraying himself (laughs) as the personification of France, (laughs) then eventually as the god Apollo or of Alexander the Great, (laughs) with a focus on mythological and allegorical attributes instead of his true likeness. I mean, quite an ego. Yeah. Louis died of gangrene after (gasps) having dealt with many health issues as he aged, including diabetes, dental abscesses, boils, gout, and headaches. Ah. He died in 1715, outliving most of his line of succession. Wow. So now I'm going to tell you his line of succession. His only legitimate son, Louis, the Grand Dauphin, died in 1711 at age 49. Remember, Louis died in 1715. The Grand Dauphin's oldest son, Louis, the Duke of Burgundy, died of the measles in 1712 at the age of 30. His son, Louis, Duke of Brittany, and his wife died the same year. They all got the measles. But... His Mm. second son, also Louis, the Duke of Anjou, became the heir. (laughs) He also had the measles, but his governess wouldn't let the doctors bleed him anymore, like they did to his brother, so he survived. (laughs) He inherited the throne at five years old and ruled for almost 59 years. Here is a really interesting fact about Louis XIV. 
He loved ballet, and he danced in 80 roles in 40 major ballets. Oh. Yeah. That is not in the TV show. Though I would love to see George Blagden in tights. (laughs) (laughs) Round two. All right, Nikki. On the path to doppelganger, what do you think the next degree is? Did you say Versailles in there at all? I did not. Okay, this this is kind of weird, but you said measles a lot, because all those kids kept getting the measles, and I really want to connect some sort of disease with paranormal doppelgangery. Is that a word? Can that be a word? Sure, absolutely. Let's make it a word. Yeah, I agree. I feel like if I thought long enough, I could I could make that happen, so I'm going to go with measles, in the hopes that there's some weird, tenuous connection. Your guess of measles is incorrect. The next degree is House of Bourbon. Oh. So the House of Bourbon is a European royal house of French origin and a branch of the Capetian dynasty. Bourbon kings first ruled France and Navarre in the 16th century. By the 18th century, they had thrones in Spain, Naples, Sicily, and Parma. And those were held by members of the Spanish Bourbon dynasty. The house started in 1272, when the heiress of the Lordship of Bourbon married the youngest son of Louis IX. It was considered a cadet branch, so like the younger son's line, until Henry IV became the first Bourbon king of France in 1589. Cadet branch sounds adorable, by the way. Yeah, cadet branch. That just means like... The older brother is king, so the younger brother starts a cadet branch. The House of Bourbon ruled France until the French Revolution overthrew the monarchy. Then they got it back in 1815. Then they were overthrown again permanently in 1830 during the July Revolution. The House of Orleans, a cadet Bourbon branch, took over and ruled for 18 years until it too was overthrown. Nobody was, ever could get comfortable in their throne, I swear. No. When the Bourbons inherited the strongest claim to the Spanish throne, they passed it to a cadet Bourbon prince, a grandson of Louis XIV, and then that grandson became Philip V of Spain. When France and Spain ratified Philip's renunciation for himself and his descendants, a permanent separation of the French and Spanish thrones was complete. This is how they established the Spanish House of Bourbon, And it was also overthrown and restored several times between 1700 and 1859. Spain and Luxembourg currently have monarchs of the House of Bourbon on the throne right now, but the House of Bourbon doesn't rule in France anymore. The house and its surviving branches are believed to be the oldest royal dynasty of Europe and the oldest documented European family altogether. That is still existing in the direct male line today, and the ancestors can be traced back to before the year 1000. Oh, goodness. Yeah. All legitimate living members of the House of Bourbon, including its cadet branches, are direct descendants of Henry IV through his son, Louis XIII of France. The article lists all of the houses of Bourbon, all the rulers, there's a family tree, If you want to see how we got from 1 to 14 and farther, that's where you should go look. Interesting fact about the House of Bourbon. Bourbon County is a county located in the United States state of Kentucky. It was established in 1785 from a portion of Fayette County, Virginia. And it's named after the French House of Bourbon in gratitude for Louis XVI of France's assistance during the American Revolutionary War. Round three. Okay, Nikki, what do you think the next degree is? Now, I don't know, but I'm going to guess the French Revolution because I feel like that could go a whole bunch of different ways. Oh. Maybe one of those will get us to crazy doppelgangers. Okay. Your guess of the French Revolution is incorrect. Oh, what is it? The next degree is renunciation. Oh. All right, Rosanna just picking tiny words out of 
whole big sentences. Yes, exactly. Fine. <laughs> Guess that's how we do things now. That's how we've always done things. <laughs> <laughs> Renunciation is the act of rejecting something, especially if it's something that the person enjoyed or endorsed. Legally, it could mean the rejection of a nationality, a citizenship, or a property. Like if it's left to you in a will, you can renounce it. Oh, okay. In religion, it can indicate abandonment of material comforts in the attempt to achieve spiritual enlightenment. In Christianity... Renunciation of the devil is a common tradition and it's often seen in connection with a baptism. In the Roman Catholic Church, baptism usually includes the prayer of exorcism and the parents and godparents are asked to publicly renounce the devil. In the Church of Norway, it's an obligatory element in the main service. In Hinduism, the renounced order of life is sannyasa. In Buddhism, it's nakama. And they mean giving up the world and leading a holy life. Here is a, I'm going to use the term interesting loosely. Here's an interesting fact. <laughs> In 2014, the Church of England dismissed the rubric of renunciation as an attempt to widen the appeal of the rite of baptism. A prior report for the church's oh. liturgical commission stated that for the majority of those attending, the existing provision can seem complex and inaccessible. Round four. What do you think the next degree is? Four already. Did you say Satan in there? Uh, I did not. Did you mention renouncing Satan? Oh, I said the devil. Oh, the devil. I'm going to latch on to that because the devil in many mythos is pretty paranormal. And the devil could be the cause of something that causes doppelgangery, which is now officially a word. Yes. Check it in your dictionary, people. Awesome. The devil's all I got. I'm going with the devil. <laughs> At least it's not Hitler. Is that better or worse than going with Hitler? <laughs> I don't know. Or is it the same? <laughs> your guess of the devil is correct. <gasps> oh my gosh <laughs> this is the first one i've gotten right in so long of course it'd be the devil time, yeah. and i'm very happy <laughs> <laughs> oh okay i learned from when i didn't go with hitler so <laughs> so the link for the devil actually does redirect to satan satan is an entity in the abrahamic religion that seduces humans to sin in Christianity and Islam, he's often seen as a fallen angel that used to be pious and beautiful, but rebelled against God. He has power over the fallen world and demons. The figure called the Satan first appeared in the Hebrew Bible as a heavenly prosecutor and a member of the sons of God, testing the loyalty of fol followers by forcing them to suffer. So he was a really evil lawyer, basically. Oh, yeah. And a, and a tempter. It was all entrapment. During the intertestamental, which is the time between the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, Satan developed into a malevolent entity in a dualistic opposition to God. In the Book of Jubilees, which is an ancient Jewish religious work, Yahweh gives Satan, who is called Mastima, charge over a group of fallen angels to tempt humans to sin and then to punish them. See? Entrapment. Hmm. In the book of Revelations, Satan appears as a great red dragon who is defeated by Michael the archangel and cast out of heaven into a lake of fire. In Christianity, Satan is known as the devil. He's not specifically mentioned in the book of Genesis, but he's often identified as the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Though his appearance has never been described in the Bible, he's been portrayed as having horns, cloven hooves, hairy legs, a tail, and sometimes he's holding a pitchfork. And these traits were actually influenced by pagan deities like Pan and Poseidon. Yeah, I was going to say he sounded like a satyr. Yeah, he does. In medieval times, he was mostly just used as comic relief, which probably made him really mad, I'm just saying. <laughs> or I feel like he's the kind of person that would really enjoy that. 
His significance increased with the beliefs like demonic possession and witchcraft that started getting going in the 16th and 17th centuries. Then people were like, oh yeah, devil scary. Mm -hmm. The belief in the existence of Satan was actually mocked during the Age of Enlightenment, which we talked about in the last episode. But people still believed in it, particularly in the Americas. In more modern times, Mormonism developed views on Satan. The Book of Moses explains that the devil offered to be the redeemer of mankind for the sake of his own glory, and then when his offer was rejected, he became rebellious and was cast out of heaven. Belief in Satan and demonic possession is still really strong among Christians in the United States and in Latin America. In a 2013 poll, 57% of people in the U.S. believed in a literal devil. The Arabic equivalent of the word Satan is an adjective that means astray or distant, where Satan's name is Iblis. And Muslims don't think that Satan is the cause of evil, but is a, temp a tempter who takes advantage of humans' tendency to be self-centered, which seems like it'd be easy to do. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to say he should start with King Louis, who had all the <laughs> pictures of himself painted constantly is for the important people. Yeah. Interesting fact about Satan, the term theistic Satanism is the umbrella term for a religion that considers Satan a deity and worships or reveres him. I know some versions of Satanism aren't about committing evil or really worshiping the devil. They're about rationalism and actually being kind. Round five. All right, Nikki, what do you think the next degree is? I'm so ready. Okay. It's demonic possession. Okay. Right? Right? Because something about doppelgangers and possession. Your guess of demonic possession is incorrect. Oh. I'm sorry. Witchcraft? No. Wizardry? Uh-uh. The next degree is dualistic opposition, which... No. No. To... No. Dualistic cosmology. Yes. <sighs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> I know. Would you like to hear about dualistic cosmology? I would. <laughs> Have you ever heard of that before? No. Dualism in cosmology is the moral or spiritual belief that two fundamental concepts exist and that they oppose each other. Okay. It covers a bunch of views from traditional and scriptural religions. It implies that there are two opposites at work. Okay. In Christianity and Hinduism, dualism can be between God and his creation or God and the universe. In Taoism, which is a Chinese philosophy, it's the belief that divides the universe in the oppositions like of yin and yang. Oh, cool. Myths and creation motifs with dualistic cosmologies explain that the world was created and or is influenced by two beings who are usually but not always competing with each other. If they're not rivals, they're considered collaborators. They can be contrasted okay. like good versus evil, and they're often portrayed as twins or brothers. These mythologies are found all over the world. Dualism can refer to duotheism bi-theism or ditheism. Bi-theism and ditheism imply the belief in two equally powerful gods with complementary properties. But bi-theism implies harmony, like a divine couple, like the sun and the moon, while ditheism is a rivalry, okay. like the creator and a destroyer, so like God and the devil. Oh, uh, yeah. Interesting fact, in Hinduism, the Dvaita Vedanta school of Indian philosophy's dualism is between God and the universe and theorizes the existence of two separate realities. The first and the most important reality is that of Shiva or Shakti. Shiva or Shakti is the supreme self, God, the absolute power and truth of the universe. Then the second reality is a dependent but equally real universe that exists with its own separate essence. Like a parallel world. Round six. Nikki, we've come to the last degree before we land on Doppelganger. What do you think it is? 
Now, I always hope by this point it's obvious, and yet I have two things written down, and I could go either way. Okay, let's hear them. One thing is twins, but I'm pretty sure you've done twins before. Hmm. So I feel like it shouldn't be that. But the other thing is you said malevolent, or malevolence, I guess, and doppelgangers, I think, are often considered malevolent. And also, I really like that word because it's fun to say. It always makes me think of Maleficent. Yeah. I'm probably going to freak out when I get this wrong, but I'm going to go with malevolent just because I like it. Okay. Giving it a chance. Okay. Taking a risk. Good for you. Your guess of malevolent is incorrect. Okay. What is it? Don't get mad. Oh, no. Is it twins? Not exactly. The next degree is, <laughs> more specifically, twins in mythology. Fine. I mean, it's it's a different article than That's... twins. <laughs> it is, and it sounds really interesting. It is, it is. Twins appear in the mythologies of lots of cultures, not just what you think of like Greek mythology. They're everywhere. They can be seen as ominous or auspicious. And they're often cast as two halves of a whole or sharing a bond that is deeper than just siblings. Twins also can represent the outside aspect of a self, like a doppelganger or a shadow. <laughs> and sometimes there's an evil twin and a good twin. In Greek mythology, twins could be conceived when a woman becomes pregnant by a mortal and a god on the same day, making one twin godlike oh. and the other ordinary. So like... Hercules and his brother, Aphicles. Apollo and Artemis are also twins, and they are the god and goddess of the sun and the moon. In Native American culture, women avoid twin fruits, like a double banana, believing that it would increase the chances of twins. And that's a good reason to avoid it. I agree. In many of their stories, twins are partners in adventures and quests. One set of Navajo hero twins were called Monster Slayer and Born for Water. Oh. Those are great names. I want a name like that. <laughs> yeah. In a version of the Egyptian creation myth, the earth god Jeb or Geb and the sky goddess Snoot were twins. In Norse mythology, Frere and Freya are twins, and they are the god and goddess children of Njora. An interesting fact about twins in mythology... The Greek twins Castor and Pollux, where Castor mm -hmm. was mortal and Pollux was the son of Zeus, were so close that when Castor died, Pollux gave up half of his immortality so he could be with his twin. Their constellation oh. Gemini is only seen during one half of the year, as the twins spent half of their time between the underworld and Mount Olympus. And that leads us to our last degree, doppelganger. A doppelganger is a non-biologically related look-alike person, sometimes portrayed as ghostly or paranormal, and is usually seen as a harbinger of bad luck. Sometimes a doppelganger is called an evil twin. But only when they have a goatee. Of course, obviously. <laughs> or an eye patch. That's how I recognize my evil twin. You're, with a goatee. Your evil twin has a goatee. <laughs> <laughs> She's very recognizable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the word is commonly used in slang to describe someone that closely resembles another person. Like, oh my god, I saw your doppelganger today. The word doppelganger is from the German word, which is spelled like doppelganger, but is pronounced differently. And that word is a compound for the word double and walker. Interesting fact about doppelgangers. Rosanna apparently has a doppelganger that's in the movie Halloween Town. Oh, I forgot it's about her. It's constantly being compared to her. <laughs> that's true. Kimberly J. Brown is my doppelganger. <laughs> <laughs> the first known use of the word doppelganger was in the novel Seibenkas in 1796 by Jean Paul. He left a footnote to explain what the word meant because he was like the first one that used it. Oh, nice. Even though the idea of an alter ego or a double appeared in folklore myths and traditions throughout human history, the use of the word doppelganger for English speakers is fairly recent. Its mention in Catherine Crow's book, The Night Shade of Nature in 1848, helped to become better known and people started using it more. The doppelganger motif is a staple of Gothic literature. Percy Shelley 
who we talked about in the last episode, <laughs> described a doppelganger as a counterpart to oneself in his story Prometheus Unbound. Lord Byron also used doppelganger imagery to help illustrate the duality of human nature. Fyodor Dostoevsky's novel, The Double, offers the doppelganger as an opposite personality that attempts to take over the life of the protagonist. Ooh. Oh, creepy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting fact, with the increase of social media, there have been several reported cases of people finding their twin stranger or doppelganger online. Oh. There's even a, a website where you can put in your face and it'll run recognition software and find somebody mm-hmm. else that put in their face that looks like your face. And that's it. We've made it through all six degrees. We went from Louis the Fourteenth of France to the House of Bourbon to Renunciation to the devil, to dualistic cosmology, to twins and mythology, to doppelganger. Nikki, how'd you feel about the spiral? I liked it. Yeah? I'm such a sucker for paranormal stuff, so I really liked the devil information and the twins in mythology stuff a lot. That was fascinating. Now it's time for Cheek of the Week. This week, our cheek is two reviews. Yay! Yay, we love reviews so much. Really do. They make a difference, too, so please keep leaving us reviews, everybody. Our first review is from Morgan from The Frankenpod. It's from Podcast Republic. Five stars. Oh my god, the rabbit holes, you will fall down. Short and sweet. I like it. Thanks, Morgan. Oh, thank you, Morgan. Our next review is from Mariah from the 600 Second Saga. Learning and fun. Five stars. Wonderfully fun, always surprising, and endlessly educational. A fun surprise, or six, in each episode. Great little stories, tidbits, and information that show how everything is more tied together than you suspect. Thank you, Mariah. Mariah and Morgan are both part of the Lady Pod Squad group. If you're looking for a recommendation for a podcast, search the hashtag Lady Pod Squad. Thank you, ladies. That's our episode. Tune in next time for another Six Degrees of Wiki. You can keep up with us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Six Degrees of Wiki. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can support the show by leaving a review, buying Six Degrees of Wiki merch like t-shirts, mugs, and bags, or even by donating directly to the show at sixdegreesofwiki.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. Bye.